the purpose of today's seminar is really to understand why, how has Singapore been able to do this and are there lessons for the rest of us. Uh, so to kick us off, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Joanne Jung. She wears many hats. Uh, she's senior economist at the University of Southern California, where she also directs the USC Center for Economic and Social Research. She was formerly an associate professor at the, uh, the Sosui Hawk School of Public Health at the National University of Singapore. And she's also the founder and CEO for Research for Impact, uh, an impact and evaluation think tank that's uh, committed to advancing rigorous and objective research and evaluation uh, in Asia. So without further ado, I'll hand over the time to Dr. Yong. Over to you, Joanne. <coughs> Uh, Joanne, I can't seem to hear you. Hi, can you hear me okay. now? Yeah, good. good. Uh, good. Thanks. For that. Um, thank you very much, Donald, for the generous invitation to be here. Um, I wanted to maybe preface my talk by saying that I'm going to be presenting the experience of Singapore from the perspective of my own discipline, which is behavioral economics, which is a reflection on how what we know about um, psychology and behavioral science tells us about people's decision making and how some of the irrational or unconscious levers of people's cognitive processes actually affect uh, public policy as well as public reactions. And I know my two other esteemed colleagues will be dealing with more of the epidemiology and traditional disease control side, but I'm going to be telling you a little bit about the psychology of moving to zero COVID, um, what Singapore's experience was, on the policy side, as well as the public perception side, how that was shaped in some instances well, and in some instances with a little bit more challenge. And I'm gonna also be speaking at the end a little bit about why in general, it is very difficult for us to move from one very strong paradigm to another, even when we face exigency. Um, and so just to frame that again a little bit, um, so sorry, my slides are a bit advancing. Singapore has made a very radical transformation in their approach to the pandemic. And what we know is that when we first approached COVID-19 or COVID-19 approached us more, more, more appropriately, uh, Singapore reacted swiftly, firmly in a zero COVID stance. And the immediate thing that happened was that we shut the doors to the small open economy as quickly as we could. We responded as fast and decisively as possible to be as restrictive as we could in order to contain what we perceived quite correctly at that time to be a very uncertain and fast moving threat. The second thing that we did in response to this was provide people because we were in a situation of what we considered to be existential uncertainty with as much information on as many platforms as we could in as much detail as we could find possible. And so in Singapore, you could very quickly sign up, not just for government newspaper and websites, but you could sign up for a WhatsApp channel. And as you can see on the right, the WhatsApp channel would deliver you official messages from the government about the number of cases, confirmed cases, discharge cases, linked cases, and a number of public services messages, again, in very great detail. But last but not least, the linchpin of our strategy and what made it so effective for Singapore to address these first waves of the COVID-19 pandemic was technology-driven testing and tracing to an extremely high degree. And this was exemplary in Singapore. It was driven by our Trace Together app, as well as the testing and tracing apparatus of a contract tracing army that literally made it the mission to find every single case, to enable this as quickly as possible with the resources that we had, and to therefore bring this uh, the concept of isolation and appropriate management um, into real time as fast as possible. The other thing that was very interesting about this was that the level of information that was given to the public at this time, and I bring you back two years in time, this is March 11, 2020, today we are March 11, 2022, you will see the level of information that was given to the public. So the Ministry of Health would release information every day, multiple times a day, in very precise quantitative detail. They would tell the number of cases discharged, how many confirmed, and you can see here, they would tell you again, the exact information about the number of the cases, how many they were, what the linkages were within these cases, 
And you can see on the right, almost the entire life history of the case as it pertained to the infection that is where they got it, how they got it, when precisely they got it, in the morning, in the evening, where the exposure was and how it related to these clusters. Now, when we come back to March 11th, I advance you one year in time, March 11, 2021. And what you can see in March 11, 2021 is that we have reached, if you look here at the bottom, this is the list of updates from the Ministry of Health, a case of virtually zero COVID. So it would seem that this is a strategy for us that paid off. Right? One new case, no new cases. And on May 19, 2021, um, the Prime Minister of Singapore, Lee Hsien Loong, made a public address where he used a lot of the language around endemicity for the very first time in very strong public messaging. And what he said were three very important things. Number one, COVID-19 will not dominate our lives. We will go on. Number two, on the other hand, we cannot close our borders to the world. And number three, very important, he ended this message on a very positive note. He said, we are not in this happy state, but we are moving in the right direction. So it was very strong messaging. It highlighted the imperative, of, but it also ended on a positive frame. And I would say that from that moment, although we have had some stops and starts and pullbacks in the road, we have hewed as far as possible from the general tenor of this messaging, which has been a very important part of the overall strategy. Now, again, later on, and I think in the Q&A, we'll ask about some of the reasons why this in some places has been held up or not held up. But for the most part, taking a big step backwards, I would say that this has been the framing moment for the communication strategy going forward in a very strong and decisive way. Of course, <laughs> as you say, a good way to make God laugh is to make plans. So here we are on May 19th and quite, uh, quite a bit after that in September, as you can see, our third wave uh, quite quickly began. Regardless, we have been able to hold to this vision of endemicity for many reasons. And I think from a psychological point of view, again, I'm going to leave this to my colleagues to speak about the actual crisis management measures on the ground and the disease aspects of it. From a psychological perspective, how have we been able to manage this very fundamental sea change? The first is that there has been a very salient and urgent and visible illustration of the imperative, both from an economic, a social and cognitive point of view. It is, has been extremely clear to the Singaporean public that from an economic point of view, from a day-to-day -day living point of view, as well as the cultural touch points that we find to be the bedrock of our society, and from a mental health point of view, we are at a point where we have exhausted our resources. So you will see on the right-hand side, um, a picture taken on, a, on, a, on the top of a dorm here in Singapore, where our migrant workers have been experiencing over the course of the pandemic, the kind of burnout that we now see throughout Singapore society and in our healthcare workers. And so this messaging has been very visible to Singaporeans for months and months. Secondly, as our colleague Dale Fisher has said, part of the other things that have helped us is that we have, even though this messaging has been very strong, Singapore has adopted a gradual lifting of the lid. And so we have moved across all of the different dimensions quite slowly, in fact, to release and be responsive to specific changes in the environment. You will see um, on the right-hand side, message, uh, sort of an infographic showing how we have gradually opened up or released restrictions around social. In the middle, our VTL lanes, and on the right, actually one infographic that did not work so well <laughs> when we tried to issue very tailored guidance about who could go out to dinner and what combination of families. So this calibrated approach on one hand has been very successful because it's allowed us um, to calibrate uh, and release in very measured steps. On the other hand, again, speaking to some of these challenges, it has caused in some cases confusion and a little bit of hesitation because people really understand um, what exactly can be done or they find this as cognitively very confusing. And so one of the things that I will mention later on, the new phase of adapting a new normal is really an emphasis on simplification and perhaps trading off a little bit of that precision strategy against clearer messages about what people should do. 
But if we were to say again, why we have that confidence to move forward, the single word would be our vaccination strategy. So we rest first against the exigency of the need to open up, against the confidence that the government has tried to very strongly instill in vaccination and the extremely high rates that we have. And in order to keep those rates high, again, the government has deployed a full range of both the traditional economic policy levers, as well as behavioral nudges. So we have the kinds of nudges that we see at the bottom, social proof interventions, telling people how many are doing it, trying to change the social norms, changing access to different resources for people with vaccines. And then at the top, I think what I would consider to be the most the nudge, the, the, the most uh, strong form of stuff to make people who don't take the vaccine responsible for their medical bills. So a whole range of incentives from the very traditional um, to what we would think of as the more sort of psychological nudge-based responses. And as you can see here in Singapore, what that's done for us in terms of vaccine coverage is really take us to an extremely high level, including our booster shots. I think in terms of messaging, I want to again highlight, come back to what Donald was saying that um, actually in the third quarter of 2021, we also moved in a very significant way on a very critical level related to how we give people information about the pandemic on a day-to-day -day basis. Right? That was a sea change in what we did. And so what you can see here is 9th of September, 2021, we stopped reporting linked or unlinked cases. And that might seem a little esoteric, but what that means is that it is a very strong signal that we no longer are giving the public information of how to chase down and address clusters in a very concrete and tangible way. And so that is a very public signal, in the words of Paul Tambaya, when we stop linking cases, perhaps we have accepted that the virus indeed is everywhere. We reduce our reporting from two times to one time, and we reduced, as you can see here on the, on the graph, again, I've cut and pasted the that, uh, the exact report from that day, we have removed the practice of putting the number, anchoring people in the number in the headline of the document. The other thing that we have done is change the ordering of the information to focus on hospitalization and treatment upfront. So changing the literal focus of our messaging on a day-to-day -day basis from the pandemic itself to the health system measures and mitigation, right? Again, very radical, and this was going quite well for us once more, <laughs> even in the face of the surge. And then early December 2021, the Ministry of Health um, announced plans that they would stop daily media releases altogether. And then, of course, on December the 2nd, 2021, we returned to the headline counts because we ran straight into Omicron. So December the 2nd, again, right after we were going to stop doing that, we said, well, actually, there are two imported COVID-19 cases uh, in Singapore. And for a while, we saw a return to these headline numbers. But in actual fact, I would say that we have actually done our level best to stick to this in the face of the Omicron search. In spite of the fact that we have placed the brakes on some aspects and perhaps pulled back some aspects while we try to understand Omicron, at a higher level, as quickly as we could, we have attempted to stay the course. And so this is what happens. And you can see that right um, immediately after we announced that we were going to stop daily cases, what we thought was our third wave was rapidly eclipsed by the cliff that we see now. I'll show you the COVID update of March 11th, 2022. And what you will see is that it is not there because we no longer, in fact, do daily updates of COVID-19 information. You'll see here the list of information that comes out in February. Again, it's much more measured. We are no longer seeing our case counts, even though we are actually at the highest case counts um, that we have ever seen historically in Singapore. But our reporting has radically changed. We also, at the end of January 2022, have stopped reporting because for us, it's no longer relevant on a management level, the, the difference between Omicron and Delta, except to announce that our ICU cases are primarily Delta. Our focus now is on reporting serious cases, and we are including two counts when we report information. We report PCR confirmed, as well as PCR confirmed in the public uh, private healthcare system without a PCR test. And what that has done for us is that it radically inflated the number of cases very quickly compared to previous norms. But from a psychological point of view, the growth rate at the time, the week on week increase, then becomes something that's much more manageable, or we don't see such a huge trend in the change. And that's very important because 
for us that manages people's expectations a little better about what's happening. And again, it conveys the idea that it's now the new normal. The other things that have been done from a behavioral perspective is a huge amount of information around what we convey to the public are the new default options. And as we know, as a behavioral economist, setting the default or what we consider to be the standard of care if nothing else happens, right? So switching people to a, a, what they perceive to be the norm is one of the most critical things that we can do as policymakers. And so now what you can see on the left is that instead of hospital care, we have used precisely and explicitly the language that home recovery needs to be the default. We have adopted an approach that makes understanding the rules and regulations around COVID-19 much simpler. So we begin to understand that it's very important for us now to enable compliance, perhaps at the cost again of fine tuning. And to make it very clear that this is something that needs to be perpetuated throughout the entire level of society. So for example, now if you have an employer um, who is asking you for a medical certificate to confirm COVID or to come back to work, that's now no longer necessary. Right? So we're now doing our best as far as possible to remove these barriers and make it as seamless as possible for people indeed to live with COVID-19. Um, that being said, I just wanna say a few words um, again, I'm sure in the Q&A we'll address issues of where we've seen stops and starts in this policy. Why is this so difficult for us to do? And even in Singapore, why is this so hard for us to do? And why is it so difficult, I think, for any society that has been stuck for a long time in a specific frame to change? We have five sort of biases that we know affect all of us, individuals, policymakers, whoever we are. First is the weight of the sunk cost fallacy. The more that we have invested in a particular course of action, the more challenging it is for us because of our natural loss aversion to regard a prospective cost and benefits objectively. So the more we invest, the more lives have been lost in a particular frame of mind, in a particular course of action, the harder it is for us to leave all of that behind. It weighs on us in our decision-making, even though it should not. The second is what we call the illusion of control. And for policymakers especially, one of the problematic things for us is that we feel that something must be done and I must be the one to do it. Right? It sometimes leads to what we call action bias. And we sort of are conditioned to believe that we have the power to influence things and vigorous action is an expression of that power. Now, the way that we perceive the world doesn't help this because we, instead of being able to see the full picture after working in a particular setting for a while, we develop the actual tendency to narrow our frame. As when a problem is big, complex, sprawling, changing very quickly, in order to be able to solve the problem and prioritize coming up with a solution, our range of vision stops and it shrinks such that we just focus on one aspect. We narrowly frame our decisions in a way that makes it easier for us to think about our options but ignores the richness and complexity of the whole portfolio of choice. And unfortunately, what also happens for us is that as human beings, we find it very difficult to think logically about statistics and probability when we are confronted with the evidence of our eyes or repeated images or messaging coming to us, we think of information that is more easily, uh, easily accessible or easily available as more likely. And so sometimes we live in an echo chamber of what is around us, rather than the objective evidence of data and statistics. And that's a very human tendency. But last but not least, I just want to conclude the thing that I think is most important for us to think about is what we call zero risk bias. And zero risk bias means that because we as human beings are programmed to weight our losses more than our gains, and we're naturally risk averse. There is a tendency when we're confronted with very small risks to prefer an option that eliminates risk altogether. Even when we compare it against an option where the absolute change in risk is more beneficial, so harm reduction. So we prefer, for example, the option that goes from 5% to 0% than the option that goes from 55% to 50%. Right? The idea of eliminating harm altogether outweighs the actual expected benefit. And so we are much more drawn to the idea that we can take that risk and uncertainty away altogether 
to the point when we think of this suboptimally compared to something which has some uncertainty in it, it has a large expected benefit. That's very challenging for us when we think about zero COVID. I'm just gonna conclude here. This is our Ministry of Health website today. And as you can see, living with COVID-19 is front and center. It's an approach that we have taken here in Singapore. I think the website actually speaks to a lot of the features of the campaign. It is very simple. It's a salient message. It's, it guides people to one consistent information portal and it focuses on what people should do, right? It's relatable, it's clear, it's salient, it's accessible, and it is painted in calming colors. It used to be, when we were in the pandemic, this used to be a black page with red writing, and now it is a light blue page with black text. And as you can see here, the, the general tone is cool, calm, collective. Uh, so that's all I have for you today. I just want to thank you very much for allowing me to share these reflections and observations. And I'm going to turn this back to my colleagues um, to describe again um, in more detail the public health and disaster, ma uh, um, and disaster management aspects um, of changing tax at this point in the COVID-19 journey. Thank you, Donald. Mm, thank you very much, Joanne. That was uh, really very quite comprehensive and a very good, I thought, a very uh, detailed uh, exposition on uh, the behavioral biases, the uh, organizational biases that might impede uh, uh, a, a transition to a more sustainable approach. I think the, the main thing I took away from your session was that the Singapore government very deliberately uh, and very strategically planned for a transition away from zero COVID to a more sustainable live with COVID approach. And it prepared the population psychologically for that transition. Uh, that, and that transition has been you know, more than six months in the making. You said it started as early as uh, in, the, in, in May last year. And then that, that transition occurred only in the third quarter in, from September onwards. So I think that planning and preparation of the population is, uh, is, is, is critical. Uh, there's a quick question, maybe uh, Joanne, you can address it, about uh, under this uh, live with COVID approach, would testing and tracing be less uh, important? Uh, I, I, my sense is, yes, it is less important, right? I mean, people are now asked to test themselves and if they test positive, they, will, they should recover and isolate at home. Uh, so so what, what's the future for Trace Together then in the, under this live with COVID approach? Yeah, so I think, you know, I think our recent messaging that has come from Jano Puducherry is that Trace Together actually will last as long as, uh, as, long as we don't uh, think that COVID is 100% endemic or until, until when, when, when COVID is endemic, Trace Together actually will be discontinued, we think. Um, but we also know that the testing regime and the tracing regime that we had in the past, clearly that infrastructure is no longer in place. The ART testing has come into place. It's much more accessible. At the same time, I will say that we have made attempts to have that ART be more accessible to people. So for example, if you do get a risk warning, you can go to a vending machine here in Singapore and get those test kits uh, for free if you, if you receive a notice that you've been exposed. The price of testing has come down. You no longer need, for example, to put it, um, to upload that, that to a system. But we have, added, so while we have de-emphasized the importance of plugging all of this into a centralized contract tracing system, we have also made tracing accessible, to the, uh, testing accessible to the public in ways that it was obviously not at the beginning of the pandemic. I think, yeah, even if testing is still, you know, testing is still wi widely available, but, but it's seen as more a matter of personal responsibility, right? Uh, under the live with COVID approach, you know, as you say, it's a collective approach. All of us have to play our part. Whereas under zero COVID approach, it is the government that has to do the testing, enforce the testing and test every, uh, and trace every, uh, uh, every uh, uh, link case. So just, just to reiterate what Joanne was saying earlier about how the emphasis has shifted away from case numbers and daily counts, daily case counts, to focusing on hospitalization and, uh, and, 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 and severe cases. Uh, I'll just share with you, if I can find it, uh, if you look at the MOH uh, page on, uh, on you know, providing uh, COVID-19 data, you see that first the emphasis is on the efficacy of uh, vaccines, right? If you are non-vaccinated, the infection mortality rate of COVID-19 is almost 1%. If you're fully vaccinated without the booster, it is 0.1%, which is as low as the seasonal flu. And if you are fully vaccinated and boosted, 
it is 0.03%, which is much lower even than the uh, infection fatality rate for, uh, for, for, for flu. In, in other words, with, with Omicron and with uh, boosters, COVID-19 becomes not just an endemic disease, but becomes as no more severe, no more harmful than the seasonal flu or the, se uh, or, 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 or the cold. Uh, also, you, you look at this uh, ICU hospital and ICU admissions. This is Joanne's point about how the emphasis has shifted away from case numbers to looking at whether our healthcare system, how our healthcare system has been able to cope with, the, uh, with, with, with this Omicron wave. And you can see that the ICU admissions uh, peaked at about 18 a day and it's now come down because the Omicron wave in Singapore is receding. Uh, and look at you know, COVID cases in orange never more than 15% of total ICU bed utilization. So in other words, this is living with COVID in Singapore is eminently tolerable, right? not just tolerable, superior to zero COVID, right? Because uh, the, the load on the healthcare system is manageable, right? This is uh, no more than 15% of the total ICU bed utilize, utilization. So I think the experience of Singapore uh, speaks very well of the government's planning, anticipation, capabilities. It also speaks to an understanding of how you need to shift the tools you use away from testing and tracing and isolation to vaccination and ensuring enough healthcare capacity. And as Joanne was emphasizing, it also highlights Singapore's experience living with COVID, also highlights the importance of communicating and explaining and preparing the population psychologically uh, of the need, uh, uh, why we need to change. And finally, I thought Joanne was very persuasive in discussing some of the cognitive barriers that might limit change. I want you all to remember some cost fallacy, uh, the sense that we are in control, right? And that leads to an action bias, that leads to all the war language you hear constantly in Hong Kong. Uh, third, narrow framing, right? The focusing illusion. Fourth, the available heuristic. If you focus on case numbers, <clears throat> that's the only available uh, reference you have and, and you obsess over that and you fixate on that. And finally, we, all of us have a zero risk bias and we are drawn to this idea that we can eliminate risk even though that is not, in reality, not possible. So with that, I, I again want to thank Joanne for, for that comprehensive, very wonderful presentation. And let's move on to the second panelist, uh, uh, Dr. JJ Wu. JJ is uh, a good friend and a fantastic colleague. He's currently Senior Research Fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies at the U National University of Singapore. He's already written two books on COVID-19 in, Singap in Singapore. In fact, JJ, why are you taking so long with the third book? <laughs> the, first, the first book is Capacity Building and Pandemics, Singapore's Response to COVID-19. I read that and pretty much is a very comprehensive overview, coverage of Singapore's first year living, uh, of dealing with the pandemic. So the first year, as you recall from Joanne's presentation, was all about containment, right? all about suppression. Uh, his second book, I think, is mainly focused on 2021. It's called uh, Building Immunity, Crisis and Contagion in the City-State. Uh, and he's working on his third book now. So I, I assume, I suspect the third book is around and that, how Singapore is living with COVID, how Singapore is dealing with COVID as an endemic uh, disease that is tolerable, that is, uh, you know, that, that becomes part of our normal, normal lives. Uh, so, okay, over to you, JJ. Thank you. Thank you, Donald, for the very kind introduction. Uh, so I'm going to start, let me share my screen. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the structural and the policy aspects of living with COVID in Singapore. I will keep my presentation relatively brief so we have a bit of time to, to discuss, to answer questions. And I'm going to send us back in time. This is 2020 during the lockdown that we experienced in Singapore between um, April to May, uh, March to May rather. This is the circuit breaker. And this is a typical outdoor eating hawker center in Singapore. And now, and I move forward to today, this is what it looks like. Uh, for some of us, it's enough to send us into a little bit of a panic, but so many people with no mask on, the, the, the oh, death is floating in the air. But this is how Singapore is like today. We are trying to live as life was before, uh, with uh, some slight differences. And I'll give you a quote from the Prime Minister in 2021 October, which is about the time that we decided that we had to make a change. And he said that Singapore cannot stay locked down and closed off indefinitely. It will not work. It will be very costly. And the government concluded at that point that a zero COVID strategy was no longer feasible. And so Singapore switched to living with COVID-19. Now, 
that one important point to note from the Prime Minister's statement is that uh, the decision to shift towards living with COVID, to, to abandon the zero COVID strategy, it is intentional for sure. The government made an intention to do that. But it was a matter of a, a, a survival for Singapore. We did, didn't really have a choice. We had no access to a, a broader economic hinterland. You know that we are a small city state. We, everything we have to, we need to survive, whether it's food, financial capital, businesses, even uh, workers, employees come from overseas. So it became clear after a year of having that zero COVID strategy that Joanne talked about, that the government realized that we did, couldn't possibly sustain this forever. We didn't have the resources, we would be significantly disadvantaged. So it was at that point, uh, towards the end of 2021, having spent close to two years battling the, the, the pandemic, that we decided that we had to open up. And well, we know that the approach to this and endemicity has been quite a, a varied approach. Singapore has taken a very calibrated approach. And we begin our journey with the first box you see, COVID-19 stabilization. And that happened around the time that the Prime Minister gave his speech, which was the end of the heightened alert series of semi-lockdowns that happened in 2021. So the difference between 2021 and 2020 was that the lockdowns became a little bit softer. In 2020, when we instituted a lockdown, we shut down everything, all businesses, all FMB, everybody had to stay at home. In 2021, we realized that we could keep some of the businesses open, like the retail businesses. So when we had a, a semi-lockdown or what we call a heightened alert in 2021, you couldn't eat out, the restaurants were closed, you could only take, out, take away your food, but the shops are still open. And it was a very strange uh, phenomenon at the point. You couldn't eat Eat out, eat your meals outside, but you saw people going to buy clothes, going to the bookstores. So it was somewhat a transition to living with the pandemic, with the realization that the real spread of the disease happened when people took off their masks to eat. And after that, we entered the stabilization phase. We gradually opened up a little bit. And then we moved into a transition phase where we allowed more people to dine in at restaurants. And this is where we are right now, where five people at a time are allowed to eat together at a table. People could go back to work. Uh, public venues are reopened. And the aim is what we call the COVID-19 resilience, where we would really live with the disease. I'm going to talk about a few key policy initiatives that have allowed us to slowly transition to this living with COVID reality. And I say reality is because uh, it, it is something that we need to confront, all of us, whether we like it or not. And I think perhaps the most important aspect of Singapore's approach is vaccination. And I would say that it is the linchpin of Singapore's approach to living with COVID. As you can see from the MOH data, the, the majority of the population is vaccinated. Uh, those who have completed the full regimen across the ages have been very high, barring those in the 80 plus, but we're looking at 90, 90 odd percent. Our children is much lower because we have recently started uh, vaccinating the children based on the data we've received and parents are understandably hesitating a little bit. But I think the key message here is that the vulnerable population, those above 60, and certainly the vast majority of the population, many of whom have pre-existing conditions, are at this point uh, vaccinated. And this is the data for our booster uh, vaccine booster program. And it shows that, well, about close to 70% of the population have received the third uh, booster jab of the vaccine. Um, there is a little bit of hesitancy. There are some who, who believe that the first two shots are enough. And certainly when we rolled out the initial vaccination, it, we rolled it out in a staggered manner. We vaccinated the elderly first, and then we vaccinated those in their 50s and 60s. And then we vaccinated the young people. So uh, the, the, most of the elderly uh, the, and those in the 50s and 60s have been given a chance to take the, the boosters. So the young are now beginning to take their boosters as well. Now, with vaccination came what we call vaccine differentiated safe management measures. Now, this means that access to public venues to many of the spaces, uh, such as restaurants, shopping centers, were predicated upon vaccination. So only vaccinated persons were allowed to go to these places. And right now, only vaccinated persons are allowed to go back to the office to work. So this has understandably created some level of unhappiness and discontent. But in a way, it has provided a very hard nudge to the population 
that if you want to live normally, uh, live in COVID normally, uh, to go to work, to go to the supermarket, to go to the shopping mall, to buy your things, you need to take your vaccinations. And it is also clear that the first two shots of the vaccine is no longer enough, uh, according to the data. So the government has put in place an expiry date for the first two shots of the vaccine. Now, in order to continue enjoying the privileges of living in, in, in living with COVID, uh, being able to go to work and to go out, uh, citizens need to now take their boosters before their first two vaccines are up. So uh, that will be nine months from the second shot. And, and there were questions about Trace Together, understandably, and uh, Trace Together continues to be applied, as you can see in, the, in the, the, the infographic here. And in the picture, this is a shopping center, a shopping mall in Singapore. To enter it, you need to first scan the Trace Together app to show that you are vaccinated. And then you will enter these big gantries. And as Donald has rightly pointed out, we need to question whether we, need, we, we should keep this Trace Together regime. If COVID is everywhere, do we need to continue conducting the contact tracing that we did in 2020? Or is traced together as a system now really a means of reflecting the vaccination status of a person? Uh, from my experience on the ground, when you walk around, when you talk to some of the people who are manning the stations, they're not so much interested in whether you have uh, scanned traced together at, at, at the at gantries. What they want to see is that green rectangle you see in the picture on the left. They want to see that you are vaccinated. So I think we need to rethink our technological approach. We need to rethink the, the tools we have to emphasize differentiating between vaccinated and, uh, and unvaccinated people, rather than thinking about collecting copious amounts of data for contact tracing. Uh, so trace together, as I mentioned, we have to token the app. And this was a piece of infrastructure that we put together in 2020 that was very handy at the start that we need to rethink at this point in time. Now, closely related to vaccination is our healthcare systemic capacity. And the point of um, in really ramping up vaccination at that point was to pr uh, protect healthcare capacity. In 2020 and 2021, and in many countries across the world, COVID has given rise to very massive strains on the healthcare system. Now, uh, Donna has showed the data about people falling seriously ill after having received a vaccination. It is extremely low. And the data bears out in Singapore. This is just a, a short set of data from February and March. Bearing in mind that the population right now is highly vaccinated, uh, but the vast majority have received a booster. And you can see that the ICU bed utilization has been very low. There are uh, literally 100, 100 over empty ICU beds every, every single month. Uh, the number of COVID cases in ICU have been quite narrow, as you can see the orange band in the middle. Non-COVID cases, uh, these are par for the course. In the public healthcare system will have to deal with all, uh, people with all kinds of conditions. So the two are tied together. When I mentioned that vaccination is the linchpin, it is a linchpin because it makes sure that hospitals are able to cater to patients. Uh, this is the bed occupancy rate in general across the, the public hospitals. Uh, some hospitals like uh, TTSH, which is Tan Tok Seng Hospital, has a very high level of occupancy for various reasons. But you can see that there are some public hospitals that are they have about 70 to 80 percent occupancy rate. That means there are a lot of vacant hospital beds. Now, this data really shows that the vaccination uh, strategy has worked out, it has borne fruit, it has protected healthcare systemic capacity. Now, this is important for two real reasons. One is that we need to maintain empty beds in case there are severe cases of COVID who need to be treated, and also other cases, other, other severe illnesses. But secondly, we needed to maintain the, the capacity of the healthcare workers, the mental health, the, the strains that they have taken over the past two years. And in Singapore, there has been some, some, uh, some issues with healthcare workers leaving the system, overwork, overburden of work, and certainly some healthcare workers returning to the countries where they have come from. So the government has turned its attention to maintaining this very important set of capacities. Now, beyond uh, what we have discussed, there are ongoing plans to increase healthcare capacity. There's a the plan to increase ICU beds uh, from 280 to 500, and also to expand more manpower in hospitals. And one of the key things that we've done is uh, the picture on the right, what we call community treatment facilities. This was uh, pre-COVID, pre it was, was an exhibition hall. And when COVID came up, ramped up, we engaged architectural firms, the urban design firms to quickly design uh, community treatment facilities where we could treat uh, patients, COVID patients, 
with mild symptoms or no symptoms. And as you can see in the picture, that increased the sheer number of beds that we had available. We used exhibition halls. We used some of the uh, resorts, holiday resorts, common uh, urban facilities that were left vacant during the pandemic. And this is the theme I'll talk about later, that we need to really scour for the excess capacity that we have within the city. And how do we convert them quickly? Another important aspect of living with COVID beyond vaccination is testing. Uh, so on the right-hand uh, top, the right-hand picture is uh, an image that's familiar to all of us right now. These are your rapid test kits. And on the picture on the left is a quick test center in Singapore. So we, a few months ago, when Singapore decided to move into this living with COVID, it became also clear that general practitioner, GP clinics, doctors were being overwhelmed because many citizens having te uh, constantly testing themselves at home, they realize that they have COVID. So they quickly go to the doctor uh, first to be safe to get a doctor to check them out and to also register themselves as having contracted COVID so that they would reflect in the healthcare systems database. Now the government realized that this created long queues, overwhelming of primary care physicians. So it decided to set up these quick test centers where citizens could go and do their COVID test. And many of them will have still have to do a test there on their own, but they will be supervised by medical professionals. And that allowed the MOH to collect data to reflect the, the status of citizens who were infected without having to get all of them to go to a GP clinic. And related to this self-testing is Singapore's shift towards a home recovery program. With Omicron, uh, we realized that the, the instance of severe illness is quite low. And especially for vaccinated persons, uh, symptoms were quite mild. So for these low-risk vaccinated persons who somehow realize that they've caught COVID, whether by self-testing or whether they've been tested by a doctor, they're now allowed to self-isolate at home for 72 hours. They're encouraged to stay in the same in that room, preferably with an attached bathroom, but it's not a necessity. And for every 72 hours, they have to do a rapid test. And they'll be, they'll be allowed to leave their homes after they have tested negative. Now, as Donald said, this places responsibility on the collective, on the people. Nobody's going to police whether you stay at home for 72 hours, whether you test positive or negative. But the messaging so far has been that if you are testing negative, you should be responsible. You shouldn't run around and pass the virus to others. And by and large, most people have adhered to this. And for, based on data, we realize that uh, vaccinated people, they tend to have a much lower viral load after seven days. So on day seven, they're allowed to self-discharge. Even if you're testing somewhat positive, they're allowed to move, uh, go, go around and do their daily businesses. And for unvaccinated people, the data shows that the viral load significantly reduces after day 14. So I think this is a realization that the virus will be with us it will be uh, circulating in the system for everyone. So th in order to further reduce healthcare capacity strains, the emphasis was on home recovery and self-testing. And more recently, the government has shifted towards the employers. It's placing pressure on employers to, to tell them that you don't have to ask employees with COVID-19 for a medical certificate. They should be given medical leave. They should be allowed to work from home or remotely, so long as they can show that they have a positive COVID test. Now this again, ramps up the emphasis on trust, on personal responsibility, and not just among the employees, but the employers as well. Our employers are asked to trust their employees uh, that they are not skiving, that they have COVID, and they should not need to go to a medical center or a primary care physician to get a medical certificate. Uh, certainly, there will be abuses of the system, but I think this is a, a general direction to move. And the government also announced that employees can now uh, whistleblow on their employers who do not allow them to, 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 to take a medical leave without a medical certificate. So the Ministry of Manpower will take action on employers. Now I've come to near the end of what I wanted to talk about, and that when we think about living with COVID, uh, also living with any kind of pandemic we face in the future, we need to think about ramping up capacities beyond what we need. And one of the key things we've had at our disposal was the national reserves, the, the financial resources that we had. Now, reserves certainly are quite unique to developed cities and economies like Singapore, like Hong Kong, but they play a crucial role in living with COVID because these reserves are mobilized early in the pandemic. In, um, early to, in June 2020, Singapore made advanced orders for three vaccines. This is the Pfizer, Moderna, uh, Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, and Sinovac. Uh, 
And these vaccines were delivered in November. So having the resources to make quick orders and quickly vaccinate the population. So all of us also certainly receive our vaccines for free. Uh, treatment, uh, there's a vaccine injury uh, insurance program for anybody who falls severely ill from taking the vaccine, they will be taken care of. And in the extreme case, a lump sum of uh, a quarter million Singapore dollars will be given to somebody who suffers uh, a debilitating uh, response to the vaccine. So this requires resources. And certainly we need stockpiles. When we move towards living with COVID, we suddenly face a, a rapid uh, panic buying of test kits we realized that everybody needed to test themselves so regularly, we were running out of test kits. Well, fortunately, the government had a stockpile of test kits that quickly released. So from the consumer perspective, there were two days or three days when the pharmacies ran out of test kits and then magically they reappeared. And the same can be said for uh, surgical masks in 2020 and 2021 and for food and in the picture in a more humorous take, those are toilet paper, this was our, our toilet paper stockpile. So it has come to attention that the stockpiles were really handy. And Singapore maintained its stockpile for fear of uh, strategic uh, instability, warfare, being laid siege to. And during a pandemic, we quickly mobilized these things. So when we think about living with COVID, we have to move our minds away from this notion of resilience. Because when we think about resilience, we are going to rebound, returning to some kind of a pre-COVID condition. And the reality is that life will never be the same again cliche as that may be. And in, in a lot of my research, I focus on robustness, that the idea is to keep public sector working, functioning during the crisis to weather the storm and to bounce forward into some kind of a reality that we may not be aware of. So that is somewhat related to uh, Asim Taleb's book, Anti-Fragility. We need to be comfortable with uncertainty, uncomfortable with a reality, a future that we cannot quite conceive as yet. And beyond that, certainly there are certain things that Singapore is trying to do to live with COVID and to live with this future, other more disastrous pandemic. Uh, so we have been trying to build up our scientific expertise to understand pandemics better. We have courted a lot of vaccine uh, production companies, pharmaceutical companies to set up the vaccine production hubs in Singapore. Uh, more recently, we've contributed to global efforts to create vaccines for major uh, diseases. And as I mentioned, stockpiles, excess capacity. And as Joanne has talked about, uh, public messaging has been important. There has been some messaging on what we call disease X, which is a really crippling uh, pandemic that will affect the world. So we are hoping to prepare for that, uh, even though that may be quite difficult. And in the same speech I started off, the Prime Minister said that at an early stage, uh, zero COVID was the right strategy. The population was not yet vaccinated. There was no or little immunity against COVID-19 and people were genuinely falling seriously ill or even dying from the pandemic. But the vaccines were a game changer, a, a sort of a safety vest for Singapore. And with vaccination, COVID-19 is no longer a dangerous disease. As the data that Donald, uh, Donald has shown, it is uh, somewhat similar to a, a common flu. The, the incidence of serious illness for a vaccinated population is extremely low today. And certainly the, the lessons that Singapore can offer is in a way it's general, but it's quite unique as well. We know that there's strong public compliance in Singapore, whether it's with safe distancing, vaccination, the tough penalties against unvaccinated people who attempt to enter a shopping center by using a screenshot of somebody else's vaccination uh, certificate. But ultimately, the, the key thing that's not Singapore into living with COVID is that we had no choice we were so entirely overly reliant on the world and we simply had no other option. We had to open up. And certainly as I end off uh, vaccination, regular testing is critical for any society who wants to live with COVID. We need to vaccinate people to give them that leg up in their immune systems to deal with the virus. We need to get people to test regularly and then comply with social distancing, uh, vaccination measures, Having tested yourself, you should stay at home if you're, you're tested positive. So the state has limited capacity to enforce, to manage everyone. It has to be a collective uh, sort of responsibility. I mentioned excess capacity, having more capacity than we need, whether it is hospital space, beds, uh, manpower in the public service to conduct uh, contact tracing in the early stages of the virus, and also public communications, assuring the public, assuaging their fears, 
And I just wanted to pop up this picture because, you know, John Paul Sartre's uh, play, No Exit, seems to be quite relevant for our times. There is no exit from this pandemic. There's no way out. It is here to stay with us. While the pandemic initially uh, made our context the, the source of risk, as John Paul Sartre would say, hell is other people. The pandemic has brought it to its far extreme. But with vaccination, uh, other people are no longer dangerous to us. We can now gather with friends, with family, with associates. Uh, even as we remain confined to this post-COVID world, we can live in, in a way that is not you know, dangerous for us anymore. So I wanted to end off with just a very quick, <laughs> the two books that Donald mentioned, and the third book, Akan Datang is Malay for Coming Soon. The third book that I'm working on addresses the urban impacts of COVID on Singapore. What are Singapore's urban responses? How has the city responded? Has the city been scarred physically by the pandemic? And has the way that we live, the density that we have been used to, th th does that need to change the way we build and design the city? So I'll end off with, uh, with this, and I'll be happy to address any questions. Donald, you're muted. Thanks, thanks very much, JJ, for giving us a lot of the details and the uh, color, right? The, 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 on how Singapore managed that transition uh, to living with COVID. And I think the big emphasis, uh, correctly, is on vaccinations. Uh, and on vaccinations and getting people to assume personal responsibility, partic particularly for testing. Uh, so there were questions about, can Hong Kong live with COVID? The short answer is yes, but you must have vaccinated a very, very high percentage of your population. So I wanted to share with uh, the audience uh, a chart, a set of charts that I uh, just popped up yesterday uh, on living with COVID, on, on uh, vaccination. Um, this one, right? Look at Singapore, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, right? In these places, vaccination of the elderly is on par, and in some instances, even higher than vaccination for the rest of the population. And this is critical because we know that the elderly are far more vulnerable to severe illness or, or dying from COVID than the rest of the population, people in the 70s and above. Only two places in the world, right? Or at least in this part of the world where the elderly's vaccination rates are far below the rest of the population, Hong Kong and Macau. And I think this is shameful. It's an indictment of Hong Kong. It is also an indictment of Macau. This is shameful. Right? How can you leave your most vulnerable population with the lowest vaccination rate? Right? That is, <laughs> this, is, this is unacceptable. This is intolerable. Right? This is an indictment of the Hong Kong authorities. It's also an indictment of society because as a society, we did not persuade our most vulnerable members to do what is good for themselves and not, not even talking do what is good for the rest of society, just do what is good for yourself. We did not persuade our most vulnerable members of society to do what is, right, the, the, the only thing they could do to protect themselves, which is to get themselves vaccinated. I think this is unacceptable, it is shameful. Uh, and, and, and I hold the authorities in Hong Kong accountable for this. Uh, okay, so thanks very much, JJ. Uh, there was a quick question, maybe you can address it. Uh, we know that not just testing, but tracing, tracing, using contact tracing like Trace Together was critical in the first year of the pandemic. So what's happened to tracing now in Singapore? Do we still uh, trace every case? Uh, and do, are you are, are, are citizens notified if you've been in close contact with, uh, with, with, with a COVID positive case? What happens? Sure, thank you, Donald. Uh, tracing is still ongoing. And uh, if you register yourself with the Ministry of Health that you have caught COVID, whether with a doctor, or you can go to the app when you're self-isolating, you can upload the information. They, it immediately goes to tracing. And then it sends out a health risk notice to those whom we have been in close contact with. And those people are advised to take care of their own health, to test themselves immediately. If you're tested positive, self-isolate. So there's, it's become more of an informational thing rather than an, an enforcement kind of policy. Indeed, indeed. And uh, as I understand it, uh, Trace Together is, you know, it's all automated, right? So you're just informed that uh, one of your con close contacts that your your app or your or your phone uh, establish a Bluetooth link with has tested positive, so you're encouraged to also go test yourself. And if you test positive, you're expected to self isolate. Uh, some some people might think, oh, Hong Kong also has Leave Home Safe. Tell you, guess what? Leave Home Safe is not contact tracing. Leave Home Safe is simply registering uh, that you have entered a particular location. It is not contact tracing at all. Uh, 